Taken from Persons of Interest by Stuart Andel. Part of the Eclectic Collection. Kaspar Hauser. Nuremberg's Boy from Nowhere. The story of Kaspar Hauser begins on the 26th of May, 1828, on the paved streets of Nuremberg, Germany's second city. Appearing in the city's unsold square in the midst of a public holiday, the boy who would soon be known as Kaspar Hauser, brought great excitement and speculation at a time when the community needed it most. The young lad was first noticed when the local cobbler saw a youth looking unsteady on his feet in the center of the street, appearing to be lost and mumbling to himself. Being of a decent nature, the cobbler approached the boy to help, thinking he may be ill and disorientated. Upon reaching the youth, the cobbler asked if he could lend a hand but unfortunately, the replies were unintelligible, though the boy did appear to have an envelope in his hand that he was intent on keeping. When the cobbler finally got a look at the address on the label, he saw it was for the attention of the captain of the 4th Squadron, 6th Cavalry Regiment, Captain von Wessen Ig. Somewhat intrigued by the situation of an incommunicable boy staggering through town with a letter addressed to the captain. The cobbler decided to leave the lad to his quarry. When the pair arrived at the captain's home, they were greeted by his servants who stated that he was not there, but the pair were welcome to wait. During this period the cobbler and the boy were served refreshments by the staff, of which, the young lad refused meat with revulsion, but snaffled bread and water with great expediency and with a wild-eyed stare, showing no regard to manners. When the captain returned from his duties, the boy became agitated with excitement and was amazed by his Atiran weaponry, namely a sword. Curiously, he also uttered a few coherent phrases during this excitement. These were, want to be a soldier like father, don't know, and horse, horse. Upon further attempts to garner conversation from the lad, it appeared that these were the limits of his vocabulary. The letter that was addressed to the captain was opened and inside were found two letters though their peculiarities would only add to the mystery. The first letter was written by someone who claimed to be the boy's mother, stating that his date of birth was the 30th of April, 1812, his name was Casper, and asking the captain to, take care of my child. In addition to this, the letter also states that, he has been baptized. His father was a soldier in the 6th Cavalry. The second letter is the one that caused the most confusion. Written in the same hand, this letter stated that its author was a laborer, who had been given the boy in October of 1812, when he would have been six months old, and that he had been inflicted by God with stand children. Due to this, he could no longer take care of the one sent to the captain. This letter then went on to state that the boy had been raised in captive isolation, that he had been locked in the room on his own from infancy, and that he knew nothing of his family, nor the outside world. It also ended by saying that the captain could hang him if he wished. With the documents having been read, the captain set about questioning his young guest, but no matter how much he tried or changed the direction of his conversation, he was left with the same answers as earlier. Want to be a soldier like father? Don't know, whores, whores. The captain then declared that the boy was either an imbecile or a savage, and decided to hand his young charge over to the police. The police further questioned Casper about himself, without any progress being made from his original short vocabulary. Unsure of what to do with their unusual boy, they kept him in a cell while they looked him over. One of the officers at this time noted that, he had a very healthy color, he did not appear pale or delicate. Further observations declared that he was rather sturdy and could manage steps comfortably, climbing over ninety to his room. They also noticed that his feet and hands were soft, and had been blistering and bleeding when found by the cobbler. His clothes were tattered and his shoes were reinforced with horseshoes and nails, but none of these scraps of information provided the officers with answers to their questions. The jailer said about Casper at the time. He can sit for hours without moving a limb. He does not pace the floor, nor does he try to sleep. He sits rigidly without growing in the least uncomfortable. Also, he prefers darkness to light, and can move about in it like a cat. Sick. When a doctor came to examine Casper, he stated that the boy was around 16 years of age and the ability to remain motionless, 
came about from sitting for extended amounts of time with his legs straight out in front of him, and this was also what caused his unsteady gait whilst walking. In furtherance to this, the doctor added, This man is neither insane nor dull-witted, but he has apparently been forcibly prevented in the most disastrous way from attaining any personal or social development. After some period of time, one of the officers had the forethought to place a pen and paper in front of the boy. Casper then proceeded to cover the page in childlike handwriting, repeating letters and the same three words repeatedly. The words were the German for cavalry man, writer, and also the name, Casper Hauser. Strangely, Casper didn't respond to the name when it was first spoken to him, but he has been known by it ever since. Casper then spent the next two months in police captivity and became a sensation in the city of Nuremberg. Crowds of people would turn up at the prison and congregate outside of his cell, curious about the boy inside, who appeared to show no discomfort as the egregious onlookers watched him in his most intimate moments. There were some benefits to the public curiosity however, when the guard presented Casper with a wooden horse as a gift. The sheer joy he exuded encouraged the crowd to also bestow such niceties upon him. During this period Casper was said to have picked up numerous pieces of vocabulary from the people surrounding him, making him adept enough to be able to give a short account of his situation. As Casper Hauser had now reached celebrity status in the city, the council opted to publish the account of their child of Nuremberg. He neither knows who he is nor where he came from for it was only at Nuremberg that he came into the world. Here he first learned that, besides himself and the man with whom he had always been, there existed other men and other creatures. As long as he can recollect, he has always lived in a hole, a small low apartment which he sometimes calls a cage, where he had always sat upon the ground, with bare feet, and clothed only with a shirt and a pair of breeches. In this apartment he never heard a sound, whether produced by man by an animal, or by anything else. He never saw the heavens, nor did there ever appear a brightening, daylight, such as at Nuremberg. He never perceived any difference between day and night, and much less did he ever get a sight of the beautiful lights in the heavens. Whenever he awoke from sleep, he found a loaf of bread and a pitcher of water by him. Sometimes this water had a bad taste, whenever this was the case, he could no longer keep his eyes open, but was compelled to fall asleep and when he afterwards awoke, he found that he had a clean shirt on, and that his nails had been cut. He never saw the face of the man who brought him his meat and drink. In this hole he had two wooden horses, and several ribbons. With these horses he had always amused himself as long as he was awake, and his only occupation was to make them run by his side, and to fix or tie the ribbons about them in different positions. Thus, one day had passed as the other but he had never felt the want of anything, had never been sick, and, once only accepted, had never felt the sensation of pain. Upon the whole, he had been much happier there than in the world, where he was obliged to suffer so much. How long he had continued to live in this situation he knew not, for he had no knowledge of time. He knew not when, or how he came there nor had he any recollection of ever having been in a different situation, or in any other than in that place. The man with whom he had always been, never did him any harm. Yet one day, shortly before he was taken away, when he had been running his horse too hard, and had made too much noise, the man came and struck him upon his arm with a stick, or a piece of wood, this caused the wound which he brought with him to Nuremberg. Pretty nearly about the same time, the man once came into his prison, placed a table over his feet, and spread something white upon it, which he now knows to have been paper, he then came behind him, so as not to be seen by him, took hold of his hand, and moved it backwards and forwards on the paper, with a thing, a lead pencil, which he had stuck between his fingers. He, Hauser, was then ignorant of what it was, but he was mightily pleased, when he saw the black figures that began to appear on the white paper. When he felt that his hand was free, and the man was gone from him, he was so much pleased with his discovery, that he could never grow tired of drawing these figures repeatedly upon the paper. This occupation almost made him neglect his horses, although he did not know what these characters signified. The account then goes on to state that who is presumed to be Casper's captor, taught the boy to stand, 
before returning and taking Casper from his prison. Over the next few days Casper drifted in and out of consciousness and the man with whom he'd always been, endeavored to teach him to walk. Eventually, they reached Nuremberg and the man thrust the letter into Casper's hand, before vanishing. The incredible case of Casper Hauser, soon became an international affair and the boy who had appeared from nowhere, became the topic of conversation on most people's lips. Some even rumored, that he was of royal lineage, possibly from the House of Baden. Different rumors on the other hand, claim that Caspar Hauser was nothing but an imposter. In an attempt to solve the mystery, the Nuremberg police launched a search to find Caspar's original prison, but it was to no avail. They also found it impossible to find evidence of a link between the boy and the 6th Cavalry. The people of Nuremberg were entranced by their mysterious arrival however, and so they decided to formally adopt Casper and money was donated to take care of his upkeep and education. To provide the boy with the upbringing he needed, he was placed into the care of Professor George Friedrich Dahmer, a local educator and philosopher. Throughout Casper's stay with Dahmer his capabilities were always being assessed, with Dahmer thinking of his protege as the perfect feral child. There was a great deal of interest in the subject at the time, with the focus being on how such a feral child would react to being brought into society. Dahmer stated during his observations that Hauser's animal senses were well developed beyond those of a normal human. His hearing was said to be pin sharp, and his eyes were accustomed to the dark much more than they were to the light. His sense of smell was said to be such that he could track animals by their scent, and distinguish between trees on the smell of their leaves alone. However, even though Caspar Hauser appeared to have keen instinctual senses, he was also somewhat confused by everyday notions, one of which, was the difference between an animate and inanimate objects. When he first saw a grandfather clock ticking in the hallway, he appeared to be struck with helplessness and would not approach the object due to his fear it was alive. Another everyday object that brought befuddlement to Caspar was a mirror, which when he looked into it and saw his reflection. He immediately went behind it to see where the person, his reflection, was stood. When a small flame was placed in front of him, Caspar tried to pick it up off the paper before yowling in pain when he was inevitably burned, but perhaps the best example of Caspar's lack of common knowledge came in his response to a ball bouncing, which he thought did so of its own accord and because it wanted to. Through Dahmer's careful nudging and cajoling, Caspar Hauser soon adapted to his new surroundings, learning to read, write, and articulate, also becoming accomplished at sketching. In one rather strange experiment, Professor Dahmer held a magnet towards Casper's stomach and when he did so, the boy said it pulled him. When the professor turned the magnet around, thus reversing polarity, Casper said it blew, as if pushing him away. Amongst all the furor, Casper became a much vaunted celebrity in the city and was invited to many of Victorian society's social functions, becoming somewhat of a tragic sideshow like John Merrick, the Elephant Man. By now however, the rumor mill that had started as whispers, was now a much bigger beast in its voice, with the community splitting into sides. One group were the believers of Casper, who thought he was illegitimate child of the Grand Duchess of Baden. In support of their theory, they asked the question, for what reason would a peasant family hide away a child? They also pointed to his ease of acquiring new skills, believing that peasant children would not be capable of such efforts. A second group thought Caspar Hauser was nothing but a normal boy who had been through exactly what was stated, and a further group believed he was nothing but a foreign hoaxer who couldn't speak the language initially, due to him being in a new country. To try and alleviate the concerns around him and tell the people his story, Caspar Hauser and Professor Dahmer started work on his autobiography. Unfortunately for the people of Nuremberg, Caspar Hauser's autobiography was somewhat of a damned squib, a rather deflating event. Nothing new was gleaned of his life, upbringing, or the means by which he traveled to Nuremberg, the only real detail it gave was about his life in isolation, which was already common knowledge at the time. Soon however, there would be a new turn of events in the life of Caspar Hauser. On the 17th of October in 1829, Hauser was noticed to be absent from the lunch table and so a search of the house was undertaken. 
After a short while he was found in Professor Dummer's cellar with an open wound to the forehead. When he was asked what had happened and why he was in such a disheveled state, Hauser told his caretakers that he had been attacked by a man with a black face, thought to be a mask, while using the toilet. More notably however, he said the attacker threatened him with death and that he recognized the voice as being that of his captor. Interestingly, when the trail of Hauser's blood was followed, it was deemed that he had first fled to the first floor, before returning downstairs and climbing through the cellar trap door. This elongated route in which he could have alerted his household, has been raised as a red flag by some, especially taken in the context that Hauser had been arguing with Professor Dahmer some moments before. The people of Nuremberg didn't see things that way however, and they were both shocked and horrified on the attack on their famous son. In an effort to stop further attacks on Hauser, whom they believed held secrets of enemies in high places, the town council moved the lad to a different and undisclosed location that was under constant police guard. Over the coming year Hauser was still the darling of Nuremberg society, but he was by now becoming known as somewhat belligerent and possibly a liar, and as with all periods of unfounded fame, he began to wane in the public's perception. In 1830 however, he would briefly return to the limelight with a bang. On the 3rd of April that year, Caspar Hauser was living with a family by the name of the Bilberbacks, when his life was suddenly threatened yet again, this time by accidental gunshot. When Hauser's defenders heard the rapport of gunfire and came rushing to his aid, they found him bleeding from a cut to the head and unconscious. When he came to a few moments later, he stated that he had fell while overreaching whilst stood on a chair. As he fell, he accidentally pulled down a pistol placed on the wall, which discharged and grazed his forehead. Although the incident appears to be rather benign and hardly worthy of mention, after all, we all have accidents, it still does have a little merit in helping us understand the possible machinations behind the incident. Apparently, immediately preceding the accidental gunshot wound, Caspar Hauser had been arguing with the head of the household. It would then follow that Hauser suffered two minor head injuries, after two heated arguments with his guardians. In addition to this, some witnesses to the event stated that the wounds didn't look to have been caused by a gunshot. Soon the citizens of Nuremberg tired of supporting their famous son and complaints began to arise about the cost of keeping such an individual. Thankfully for Hauser, a British nobleman by the name of Lord Stanhope arrived on the scene. In 1831, Lord Stanhope was given temporary custody of Hauser in return for his contributions towards Hauser's upkeep. Somewhat of an eccentric aristocrat, Stanhope is believed to have seen Caspar Hauser as an oddity, an unusual toy with which to impress his friends, though he also took him on a tour of Europe to discover his true origins. The tour of Europe, however, turned out to be bunkum. Although Hauser had apparently uttered Hungarian words and recognized Countess Matheny as his parent, they were laughed out of the royal court and Hauser didn't recognize any of the capital's features. When the Bavarian royal line threatened to sue, Stanhop called his little adventure off and the pair returned to Germany, their relationship having matured to one of sullenness and distrust. Caspar Hauser's care was then transferred to Dr. Johann Georg Meyer with Lord Stanhope still providing upkeep and assuaging his young benefactor that he would take him to England, eventually. Dr. Meyer was a schoolmaster and somewhat of a disciplinarian, who looked down upon Hauser's tale as one being based on lies. To help his student, Dr. Meyer had Hauser confirmed into the Protestant church and drove him to learn Latin and numerous other subjects, though rather than encouraging his protege to shine, the impetus had the opposite effect with Hauser becoming introspective and moody. There may have been significant other aspects contributing to Hauser's gloom however, his visit to England was looking to be a non-event, and his moment as Nuremberg's darling was generally over. All in all, he was having a rather unproductive time when Dr. Meyer described him as having vastly exaggerated abilities and the comparative mind of an eight-year-old. On the 14th of December, 1833, Caspar Hauser came staggering into Dr. Meyer's home. His face contorted in agony as he called out, man stabbed. Knife. Park. Give wallet. Go quick. He then collapsed to the floor, bleeding in a heap. 
Over the next several days, the communities of Nuremberg and Ansbach nervously awaited news of Hauser's condition. The word was that Kasper had been stabbed in the chest and what was seriously ill, the knife having damaged his lung. He did manage to give a few details of his attacker however. Hauser stated that a stranger who was tall with dark whiskers and a dark coat, had approached him and asked if he was indeed Kasper Hauser. When Hauser had replied with the affirmative, the man had offered to divulge information on his familial origins and led Hauser to the city park. Once there, he handed Hauser a purse and proceeded to stab him in the chest before making his getaway. With that knowledge, the police immediately descended on the park to capture the assailant or evidence that would do so, and whilst investigating the scene, they found a small purse that contained a note in mirror writing. The note after translation, read as thus. Hauser will be able to tell you quite precisely how I look and from where I am. To save Hauser the effort, I want to tell you myself from where I come. I come from. On the Bavarian border. On the river. I will even tell you my name is M. L. O. Kasper Hauser dried of his wounds on the 17th of December, 1833. The Bavarian public were outraged at the incident and huge rewards were offered for information leading to the young man's murder, although not all hands point in the same direction. It should be of particular note that five days prior to the stabbing, Hauser had been involved in a large argument with Dr. Meyer, and Meyer himself was convinced that the wound was self-inflicted. Over the years numerous conspiracies have been put forward regarding the true nature of Kaspar Hauser, including those of people who believe him to be from another dimension or planet. However, there are also many theories stating that he was a simple conman, leading people on a dance while he reveled in his celebrity. Either way, his gravestone probably sums his life up most adequately. Kasper Hauser was buried in Ansbach, where his headstone reads, in Latin. Here lies Kasper Hauser, riddle of his time. His birth was unknown, his death mysterious. 1833